Enric Sala leads an elite team into a hidden world in search of an underwater Eden where humans rarely venture and sharks rule. This is amazing. You can see this almost anywhere else in the world. Diving into unpredictable seas and untamed nature in a daring exploration of a wilderness under the waves. What they find could hold the key to saving the world's oceans. Tahiti, the South Pacific. A small group of scientists is on a mission with an almost impossible goal, to find the last stretches of ocean that remain as they were before man. Leading the expedition is Dr. Enric Sala, a National Geographic explorer and research scientist at Spain's National Council. What I'm doing to help protect the ocean is come to places like this, wild, pristine places, explore them, understand how they work, and raise awareness. Tell people what the ocean used to be like, to try to build this global community of people who really care, ocean lovers, and all together we can help protect the ocean. It's a challenge he's met before. He's helped create protected areas in the Sea of Cortex and the Caribbean. The coral reefs of Tahiti are a mecca for scuba divers. We perceive them to be some of the healthiest in the world. Life appears to flourish here. Thousands of fish feed on plankton and algae. They are prey for numerous ocean dwellers, jacks, snapper and mores, mid-sized carnivores. And then, sharks. They rule the food chain in a way we've come to expect. An abundance of small prey sustaining a few top predators. But Enric can see that this paradise is in trouble. This used to be a really nice coral forest with very really big corals. But now, most of the corals are very small, and most of them are dead and covered by algae. Human impact has taken a destructive toll. To Enric's surprise, the sharks here are small in size and few in number. To find a truly pristine ecosystem, Enric must leave Tahiti and push further into unexplored territory. He hopes that each unique reef he explores will offer a different snapshot of a pristine ecosystem. The sharks he's about to encounter have probably never seen humans before. In the port of Papiete, Tahiti, the quest begins. The research team boards a floating laboratory called the Hanse Explorer.
the destination is 800 kilometers away, the Southern Line Islands, a remote chain belonging to the country of Kiribati. Over 30 days at sea, they'll cover nearly 3,200 kilometers on a journey to the tiny atolls of Flint, Vostok, Starbuck, Malden, and Millennium. Five unique islands, five pieces to the puzzle. On board, the team preps for its mission. They are marine ecologists, fisheries experts, microbiologists. The team even includes a land-based scientist. Explorer Mike Fay will be surveying island ecology above the water. The team will explore these unique outposts of marine life. Then Enric will present the findings to the government of Kiribati and create a brand new protected area. 35 hours later, the ship arrives at Flint Island, four kilometers long and less than a kilometer wide, a tiny speck in the vast Pacific. Flint, like all the islands the expedition will visit, is the top of an ancient volcano, ringed by a steep reef and surrounded by deep ocean. The reef here is so short, so the waves are breaking right there. So it's impossible to dive on the on the windward side. So we'll have to dive on this on this side here, protected from the from the waves. And we'll meet at lunchtime to see what's there. They'll dive at sites around the island. Start start here, and this will be the Reefs never fully explored. Concentrate on the driving. Let her load the boat. They will face a host of dangers. Diving here is not for the faint hearted. Hundreds of kilometers from civilization. If anything goes wrong, they're on their own. For Enric to understand how the system works, he must learn what it's made of. Biomass is the weight of each type of fish on the reef. The team already knows the average weight and size of each species, so by estimating their numbers, they can calculate how much each population weighs. Knowing the biomass of the different species gives Enric a picture of how the reef functions. 
what they find at Flint Island is a surprise. For a reef this remote and vibrant, there are far fewer sharks than Enric expected. It's generally believed the rules underwater follow a similar pattern to those on land. Huge numbers of plant eaters sustain a smaller number of carnivores. At the top, an even smaller number of apex predators, like sharks, cap the pyramid. The absence of sharks is a clue that something may be wrong at Flint Island. To complete the ecological survey, the team must also explore the islands above water. Mike Face speciality. It's all good until the very last second. <laughs> Mike is a conservationist and National Geographic explorer in residence. He's been instrumental in establishing protected areas in Gabon, on the west coast of Africa. Mike will go ashore, if he can make it. Looks like that's about the only place that doesn't have breakers right there. Mike may be the first visitor here in years. So I can, we can radio back. The only way for him to reach Flint Island is to swim through powerful waves and risk being ripped to shreds on the jagged reef. He needs to enter a narrow cut, then climb onto the reef and pick his way to shore. Yes, go, 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 go. To the right, to the right, right. Breaking waves push him toward the reef. Undertow sucks him back. The inflatable is no use. Too far in, these powerful waves will rip it to shreds. Mike is in trouble. Caught between the heavy surf and a powerful undertow, Mike Fay is exhausted. Desperate, he waves for help. Go get him, go get him. Enric Sala jumps in. Keep going, keep going. But Mike's trapped in the surf zone. Enric can't reach him without putting himself in danger. Finally, there's a break in the waves, and they swim to safety. The mission to Flint Island will have to wait, for now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Later, when the waves calm, Mike tries again and succeeds. He finds an island shaped by man. In the 1870s, the native plants were stripped and tens of thousands of palm trees were planted to produce coconut oil. About 30 years later, the island was abandoned and left isolated by the pounding surf. Below the ocean swell, the science team looks to the coral for clues to its health and for signs of human impact. Marine ecologist Jen Smith's goal is to determine just how much of the seafloor is alive. Coral and algae are the backbones of the reef and can be a barometer of the health of the ecosystem. Jen has documented coral all over the world, but nothing she's seen compares to Flint's reef. Just spectacularly dominated by coral. I've never seen so much coral in my life. 
I can take 20 to 40 photographs of the bottom in a pretty big area in one dive. Jen finds that coral covers an astounding 90% of the bottom, over three times more than other reefs in the Indo-Pacific. We're able to, to account for the three-dimensionality of the reef, the coral cover would be well over 100%. Flint's reef is a living wall of coral colonies, made up of tiny individuals called polyps. Each one is a tube topped by a mouth and a ring of tentacles to capture tiny animals. But coral's most unique adaptation is a type of algae living inside them. The algae uses sunlight to create energy, some of which it gives to the coral. It's this symbiotic algae that gives coral its color. You can tell if a coral colony is healthy by its color. And when a coral is stressed, it basically turns white or bleaches. Marine ecologist David Abura examines the effects of stress on the coral. If they're diseased, they might have a pale coloration to them or some sort of growth growing on them. David predicts how coral resists stress from its surroundings, like an attack from the crown of thorned starfish, a voracious coral predator. What I'm seeing here is that these are very healthy coral systems. Both Jen's and David's data have found Flint's reef to be exceptionally healthy. Enric has found the missing piece of the puzzle. Sharks. Hunting just below the breaking waves, ready to strike unsuspecting fish in the tumbling surf. Sharks keep fish populations under control and maintain the delicate balance between plants, coral, and fish. So I saw a couple of black tip sharks, but they were not very abundant, eh? No, and they're quite small as well. <laughs> so it, this place has been fished. So 400 miles from Tahiti, and people come here to fish sharks, eh? And it doesn't take much effort. You can see the impact. There's, you know, all the sharks are very small. They're not as abundant as they would be in other places, so remoteness is not often the protection that they need. Flint's reef is robust, but the sharks Enric finds are small and few and far between. Fishing has clearly affected shark populations, even at this remote island sanctuary. So the team presses on in search of the perfect reef and more sharks. It's an overnight journey to an even more remote location, Vostok Island. And uh, Benthic is two dives in the morning. Correct. And then in the afternoon, do, whatever we do is just fantastic. So. In the morning, the island appears impossibly small. First sighted in 1820 by a Russian explorer and named after his ship, Vostok is less than a quarter square kilometer of dry land in a vast ocean, unique because of its size. It is probably the most pristine island because it's so small they has never had human habitation and the forest is the native tree. There are no coconut trees on this island. This is the tropical forest as it should be. So here on this teeny speck of land, you have a pristine coral island in the South Pacific.
the abundance of life on Vostok's reef surpasses Enric's expectations. nearly twice as many fish as at Flint, a larger island with a bigger reef. Black tips, white tips, and gray reef sharks. Where there are more sharks, there's more of everything else. Carnivores, prey, even coral. Sharks are a clear sign that this system is healthy and undisturbed. Above the reef, Mike Fay has been a castaway on tiny Vostok Island for three days. Enric Saller joins Mike Fay to see what he's discovered on the island. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. To understand the entire island ecosystem, the land must be studied as well. After three days, you know every bird, you know every plant, you know every lizard. This is the most gorgeous small island I've ever seen in my oh, life. You wait till you see this forest. It's nuts. And the canopy is completely 100%, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look Looks at like the that's light. about the only place that doesn't have breakers right there. So. This is uh, Hotel Vostok over here. You didn't have any trouble with your neighbors, huh? No, well, the <laughs> um, coconut crabs are really curious. In fact, see, there he is right there. Oh, yes, look at this. Wow. He's been around all three days. This Just... is like being in the Galapagos when Darwin got there for the first time. Exactly. The animals don't know people. But this is, this is paradise. Because they're just really curious. Unlike virtually every other South Pacific island, the forest ecosystem on Vostok is natural, despite the presence of an unusual and precious commodity. So here's just a pure mat of guano, and it kind of feels like... You can feel it. Yeah, it's like a soft wrestling mat or something like that. It's just pure, absolute, rich... You make gum guano. Bird dung, excreted by millions of seabirds over centuries, rich in phosphates and nitrogen. In the mid-1800s, these islands were stripped of this black gold for fertilizer. Vostok's diminutive size protected it from guano mining. This is what people destroy this island for. Yeah, 
really incredible. Mike leads Enric to nesting seabirds on the windward side of the island. So I counted all the boobies out here. Then there's an adult, you see she's got a baby. They are not shy, eh? So you can sit down like this. Hello. Hello, see that's daddy. Dad. Yeah. They're like, what are you doing out here, guys? Spared from human encroachment, the birds have no reason to fear people. Mike's documented eight species of seabirds here. Frigates, boobies and terns are among the residents, feeding in the rich waters. But the ocean currents carry more than food to the island's shore. Human refuse litters the beach even here. Evidence of modern life on an island virtually unchanged for hundreds of years. The hand of man is very light here. There's no doubt about that. In Vostok, the team gets its first snapshot of a pristine island. Now, they want to see a place that's equally uninhabited, but swept by different currents with a different climate. The ship heads northwest, 36 hours and nearly 595 kilometers to Starbuck Island. Starbuck is over eight kilometers long and three kilometers at its widest marked by a handful of palm trees. Starbuck gets little rainfall. Low-growing plants dot the baking coral rubble. Enric and his team are anxious to see how the parched landscape above has affected the reef below. Only a few hundred kilometers from some of the richest coral any of them has seen is another thriving reef. This one defined by one species of plant, Halimeda. Where the plant is dying off, its limestone skeleton becomes the sand of the reefs and beaches. So much algae is a sign of water rich in nutrients, food for everything on the reef. The result is an explosion of life, from the plants to the sharks.
Fisheries ecologist Alan Friedlander and marine ecologist Jen Cassell identify and count the swirling masses of fish. What we're trying to do is get comprehensive uh, estimates of not only the numbers but the sizes of animals. And the sizes are really important because that's how you get an estimate of weight or biomass. A high biomass means a large number of fish, which usually means a healthy reef. What they find is beyond their expectations. They've discovered that Starbuck has the second largest biomass of all studied coral reefs. There is eight times more life here than the Hawaiian Islands or the Florida Keys. Even more surprisingly, Enric sees a different picture of the reef emerging. Pound for pound, there are more predators here than prey. The discovery only deepens the mystery. Enric wonders how it's possible for a stable ecosystem to have so many predators. The richness of Starbucks Reef ends with the breaking waves. Enric and National Geographic photographer Brian Skerry join Mike Fay on Starbuck. Mike's been here for three days, exploring the island's legacy. In 1872, more than 100 guano miners labored here. In 1920, it was abandoned, left to a few native shrubs and desert-like conditions. Starbuck's barren landscape is a stark contrast to its vibrant underwater world. The crew wonders what its next stop will reveal, an even larger atoll. It's a 200-kilometer overnight run northeast to Molden Island. Roughly triangular, nearly 39 square kilometers, this is the largest island the crew will visit. Molden is covered in low grasses and shrubs. It was mined for guano between the 1850s and the 1920s. In 1958, Molden was the test site of three low-altitude nuclear bombs. Enric wonders how Molden's underwater landscape has survived. They find a reef teeming with life. at least 10 times more sharks than other reefs around the world. And more parrotfish, grazers that transform the reef.
Sharks and algae-eating fish are only part of a complex biological system. To understand why these reefs are so populated, the team must look beyond what's visible. Microbiologists Forrest Rower, Katie Barrett and Liz Dinsdale study microscopic viruses and bacteria known as microbes. Thousands of different microbes can live on coral. By taking water samples, the scientists hope to determine what's living on this reef. As in our own digestive system, bacteria help maintain a healthy balance. But harmful microbes can sometimes turn deadly. The team is trying to learn why sudden changes can spur this bad bacteria to grow and kill the coral. And why, once a reef is damaged, this killer bacterium grows even faster. And we don't really know where this increase in uh, bacterial communities are coming from. So we're wondering if corals and algae on the reef are actually producing chemicals which increase the bacteria. Liz Dinsdale places microbe samples in tanks with coral or algae. We can identify which organism actually enhance the growth of the bacteria in the environment. Flourishing reefs keep bad microbes in check, but Liz has discovered certain algae found on damaged reefs release food for bacteria and can cause bad bacteria to grow out of control. Development, fishing and pollution upset the delicate balance between algae and coral. If algae gains the upper hand, it can cause a bacterial explosion, which can wipe out the coral. There are ten times more microbes on reefs degraded by man. But the pristine reefs of the southern line islands are among the most robust Enric has ever studied. More corals, more fish, and many more sharks. It's an entirely new picture of the biomass pyramid of a finely tuned reef. Enric believes that here, the fish that feed on algae and plankton reproduce faster than on reefs disturbed by man, providing a constant supply of prey to fuel the mass of carnivores, sustaining more sharks than ever thought possible. 800 kilometers away, Enric hopes to find a similar model and prove the new discovery. Millennium Atoll is a lagoon surrounded by a string of islands, a very different landscape from the islands the expedition has visited so far. The outer reef breaks the ocean waves and protects a peaceful lagoon with a surprising secret. Inside Millennium's lagoon, Enric Sala makes an unexpected discovery. Blacktip reef sharks swarm the flats. You know, how many sharks are there here? Maybe 50? You know, this is amazing. You, 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 don't, you don't see this almost anywhere else in the world. The sharks are the species that go away the first when humans arrive to a place. This is a symptom of the health of the system. This system is really healthy, really pristine. Inside the lagoon, an obstacle course of reefs and pinnacles is nearly impassable by boat. Enric explores this living labyrinth. Columns 
limbs reach from the depths, decorated with impossibly delicate shapes, home to countless small fish. The lagoon is a nursery for sharks and many other species, a unique underwater landscape undamaged by the human footprint. Shipwrecked again because of you. <laughs> Man, this is the most gorgeous campsite. Yeah, it's sweet. Mike Fay has been here for a week, exploring all of the small islands called motus that ring the lagoon. He finds a very different story above the waterline, where native plants compete with imported coconut trees for precious space. What's interesting about this complex of islands is just about every single motu was planted with coconuts. And so you can see how, you know, it's gone from coconut to whatever it is today. Near Mike's camp are breeding tropic birds. This is the only spot in the whole island that we know of that has the tropic birds nesting. So most of them have chicks right now, various sizes. Mike believes that Millennium is truly the storybook South Pacific, one of the few places on Earth as abundant as it was two centuries ago. Yet, even at Millennium, there's disturbing evidence of man. Hey. These are the hooks that uh, I found this morning at Millennium. Enric believes that fishing is the greatest threat to this finely balanced well, we system. We definitely need to do something about this and, and prevent the destruction of, of the reefs. Yeah. The southern line islands may be on the verge of exploitation, but it's not too late. There's still time to protect this pristine ecosystem. Enric takes a final dive at the northeastern tip of Millennium. Millennium is a hidden treasure in perhaps the last unspoiled archipelago in the world. Enric has found his Eden, a place where coral reefs look like they did hundreds of years ago, ruled by predators. <laughs>